So yes, I'm Jason Larson. This is Marina uh, Crotophil, and this is Rocking in the Pocketbook, Hacking Chemical Plants for com Competition and Extortion. So we're a friendly team of an academic and a hacker. And so if there's any doubt, then I'm the evil devil hacker, and she's the cute academic. <laughs> so, uh, um, so we're here to play who wants to be a, uh, who wants to be a millionaire. So we're all at DEF CON uh, because we want to learn how to hack like in the movies. And if you're in Vegas, probably you want to be rich. And so this talk is about how you, uh, about giving you all the tools to get all rich and uh, get all of the girls like in the movies. <laughs> so if you want to uh, get rich and have some money, then uh, maybe you want to hack some process control networks. So industrial control systems. So in general, industrial control systems are just a whole bunch of computers that have only one thing that's different than all the other computers in the world. They run physical stuff out in the real world. Um, they run power grids, chemical plants, wastewater treatment facilities, all of that type of stuff. So typically run uh, for the uh, benefit of mankind. So industry means big business, and big business means big dollars. So some smart uh, hacker starts in a coffee shop and uh, sits down uh, and clicks on the keyboard, and then half a world away, then, of course, all the movies will tell us that um, fire and destruction, everything breaks out at some factory all the way over there. But all the stuff that happens in the middle is kind of the, one of the big mysteries of the 21st century. It's just twiddle fingers, explosion, and, uh, and nothing in the middle. So the typical understanding of SCADA hacking is that after an attacker breaks into a process control network and, uh, and, and gets control of it, there's this magic big red button, and you go mash the big red button, and whatever your thing is, it either saves the day and shuts down the process nicely or hits the button and everything blows up. Um, so in reality, the attacker actually has to build the big red button. There's not one there for him. And to start with, the attacker has to actually decide what exactly he wants to do to the process. So in general, like all attacks like, or impacts on the, uh, on the process can be divided into three groups. So you can, for example, break, uh, damage the equipment. Uh, you can go like, after the production. For example, you can either spoil the product, reduce the uh, production rate. You can make production uh, as such more expensive so the product will be less competitive on the market. Um, and these two groups of damage will never make the headlines because the companies do not need to report them and they typically do not because it's bad for their reputation. So if you want really to shame the company and make it public, then you have to make the company non-compliant. The most damaging attack will be attack, uh, attack on the occupational and uh, environmental safety because it can kill humans, it can damage the environment. Less damaging attack will be on the pollution. For example, if you contaminate the water or soil or exceed the, um, for example, heavy metals concentrations in the emissions, or like, yeah, delay the production so they violate contractual agreements. Uh, and when the attacker decides like, well, okay, what exactly do I select out of this list? So he has to like kind of follow some thinking process. So. For example, damage, equipment damage is something that come, uh, comes to the hacker, damage, uh, hacker mind first. The disadvantage is that it is irreversible. So uh, you, you can't undo it later on. Uh, uh, the other problem is that it is difficult to understand what is the collateral damage. So if you, something explodes and human in the vicinity, then it kills a human and this attack transfers into the compliance violation. Uh, the advantage of the compliance violations attack is that all of those regulations and limits and everything, it's online. So you basically, it's public information, it's easily available. Uh, again, the problem is that the collateral damage is unclear because, for example, if you contaminate the water, you may kill the fish. So many people get upset with that. Uh, this type of attack must be reported. So it's probably, it might be what you want. But if you are not unclear how well you hide your traces, you might not want to do, like it may be a problem for you because the serious guys will be investigating the case. So out of this consideration, the attacks on the production damage is actually more profit, uh, pre a preferable scenario because nobody needs to report them, nothing get killed. So for the attacker, it sounds like a more safer scenario. 
And this is actually will be the scenario which we will be considering in this talk. So we, we will illustrate your attack from beginning to end, how we will cause persistent economic damage on the plant, to the plant. And the key word here is persistent. So you won't make it hurting for a long time. That means that you have to make sure that the attack will not be attributed to a cyber event and not will be er eradicated. So this scenario will be useful, for example, for the extortion attack, or if you want to kick out the competitor out of the business. In any case, you can earn money. So. Okay, so uh, process control. We're gonna go over a little bit of process control basics for, this is a 101 track, for anybody that uh, doesn't understand process control uh, terribly well. So. Um, uh, the basic of a process control is a control loop. So if, we, if you go and uh, look at your typical thermostat, we have a nice cute thermostat, a nest here. I actually have one in my house, um, but I haven't gotten around to hacking it yet. Uh, so uh, on the thermostat, you've got a sensing element um, uh, that measures the temperature, and then you have a set point. So whatever um, temperature you set it to, you say, I want my house to be, uh, to be set to 72 degrees and keep it at 72 degrees. And so we do this because in the 21st century, nobody likes to run up and down and manually kick the furnace on every time they want it a little bit hotter and then run back up and kick it off every time they want it a little bit uh, colder. So um, in process control terms, this is a control loop. So in a control loop, you have the physical process, your furnace that's running on, and you have some sensors, namely the, the temperature sensor, and they feed back through the control systems to the actuator, and the actuators turn stuff on and on, off, uh, on and, off and keep everything in balance, um, wherever the set point is set. Uh, so um, in the control system, this is just another way uh, to look at a control system. Here we have, uh, ha have all the same processes, and uh, uh, the, the measured, uh, um, the actual observed, uh, uh, um, the actual uh, set point is called the process variable. The observed, uh, the observed temperature in the house right now is called the measure var variable. And it feeds back, and in the little red X over there, we make decisions on whether or not we should kick things on and kick things off. So if you go up to large scale, then, um, you can't really fit all of the logic that needs to run a whole big chemical plant inside of a little thermostat. So we stick them in larger boxes. We call these programmable logic controllers. And so they're just large specialized computers that sit there and run a whole bunch of logic that keeps your, uh, your plant uh, humming along smoothly. So in general, um, uh, the internals of a PLC, you have a whole bunch of sensors that are plugged into it, and one time per scan cycle, it takes all the readings from all those sensors and copies it into the input memory. Then it runs a whole bunch of logic based on that, and then produces a bunch of outputs, and those outputs then are uh, turned around and run all the uh, actuators in it. So the PLC is really the brains of the control that are running it. So most PLCs are still programmed graphically. This comes uh, back from the day when everybody um, still ran uh, processes from pegboards. You would actually have your input, plug it in the plug, run over there, stick it in an and block, um, take it to the output, and twiggle it around. And so we did that graphically, and it's still programmed that way. Um, so uh, most of the time, as a computer science, you scream no, just give me a real language. So the most uh, common uh, control algorithm that's out there is uh, PID, proportional integral and derivative. And this is just a complex set of equations uh, that run to try and keep the process within, uh, within certain limits. So outside of the PLC, you have all the PLC and the wires running all out into plants. So those are usually cabled up and run into big wiring closets. And uh, these are mostly analog things. So they do 4 to 20 milliamps, 0 to 10 volts, et cetera. So this is usually not IP-based technology. So even though the PLC has all this logic and everything the engineer can, uh, can throw into it, then uh, we still need humans. So, um, uh, so a good friend of mine that, uh, that works in nuclear uh, uh, says that uh, any chemical plant you build, um, when you first kick it on, is it uh, an imminent state of uh, a failure. And it stays that way forever. And so things go wrong all the time in, in, in plants. So anybody that's ever worked in it knows that it doesn't just hum along batch after batch like a computer program. And so um, the operator has to sit there and see all the alarms coming over there and figure out what to do with the alarms and shut things down and, and generally keep things in control. So uh, specifically for this talk, it is extremely important to understand what is the difference between IT hacking and OT hacking. Because what we are going to do he here, it's not IT hacking, it's OT, OT hacking operational technologies. So, to explain the thing, so this is the scenario of the Stuxnet. 
So you have, see the centrifuge at the end. So uh, there is a sysadmin who has figured that all out for you. There are linkage of the data between cyber assets. There are workflows. And then we have the infected PLC, which uh, prevents the uh, operator from observing the real state of the process. So the centrifuges were breaking. The operator was not aware about that. So after the attack was discovered, the next admin will start figuring out how did it happen? What interrupted the flow? Was it data integrity? Was it DOS? What kind of integrity? Was it packet injection? None of that has any sense to the operator. He does not give a shit. He, only what he says is like, I am not controlling the process. And this is what is important to understand, that in OT security, the security pro uh, properties which you need to observe are observability and controllability. You need to be able to observe or measure the process in order to be able to control it. If you are not measuring, if you are not observing the process, you are not controlling it. So you are not having your process. Um, this is yours. Um, so, uh, um, an attacker that uh, wants to uh, uh, do something behind, be, uh, beyond simple mayhem will want to reliably control the process. So if you run over there and you hack into a process and you say, like, ooh, there's a burner. Um, there's, there's a burner underneath this, uh, uh, this tank. I'll just crank up the burner and crank it all the way up and bad things will happen. Well, this isn't actually what happens. So usually what you're going to do is just exercise the shot, shutdown logic of the, of the process. Um, once you uh, hook everything uh, in the process together, they're actually re uh, related in a physics relationship. So if you crank up the temperature, you're also going to change the, the pressure and the flows and everything else that's going to happen, uh, 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 happen downstream. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, um, so, oops, I've lost my spot now. <laughs> um, so, uh, in order to uh, um, actually attack the process, you need to remain in control of the process. Um, and you need to uh, work in terms of control theory and not uh, in terms of hacker foo like SQL injections, cross site scripting, and ROM. Yeah, so in the, in, uh, when it's the attack transforms in the OT domain, the attacker and the operator, they competing for the controls over the process, and the attacker wants to win. win. So the security prop uh, properties in the IT domain are actually controllability, observability, and operability. And operability here states something like we will say availability, which describes the state of the process. So just to remember, CIA is it for information security, CO2 for the process control security. And I know that the guys who grew up with the CIA um, state of mind, they will hate it, uh, but just shake it off. Um, so uh, when the attacker goes in, uh, uh, and hits the, uh, the process, he can take one of a few approaches. Um, so he can either take control of the process and, uh, and reliably control it through the entire life cycle of the attack. Um, and uh, this is uh, what we'll talk about later. Um, he can take control of the process and control it into a state that, that then puts it in the, uh, puts an intimate failure and just kind of let it go and, uh, and let bad things happen. And that's what I talked about uh, um, a few days ago at DEF CON. Or he can uh, make the process unusable by just simply messing with the controls. And uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about that right now. Um, so let's consider a car and a driver. So the attacker's hacked into the car, and he's got control of the brakes. And so if he comes over there and he grabs the left front brake, then the driver's going to compensate and go to the left. Well, the attacker's just going to let go of the left brake and grab the right brake, and he's going to compensate back the other way until they're going back and forth and back and forth, um, trying to keep the car under control. And so since the uh, attacker is a computer, then the attacker will always be able to anticipate and win this one. Uh, uh, so. We call these actually multi-adaptive algorithms. And so in the case of the car, the human is actually called the hidden actor in the process. And so any subset, subset of a process can be modeled as a hidden actor. Um, uh, so if you have a, uh, a refining phase or whatever else, you can consider that the hidden actor and, uh, uh, and apply uh, multi-feedback uh, or uh, multi-adaptive algorithms to the feedback loops to just try and grab the feedback loops and run them back and forth and trying to get things run, uh, to run out of control. 
And so this is actually a single set of algorithms that's based on the algorithms we use to automatically tune process control variable loops, except uh, we're applying them to, uh, um, to, instead of to remove the variation to add more and more variation over time. And so you can grab those and apply them to a car, or you can apply them to a boiler, and they work just as well either way. All right, so we are ready to start. So in, whenever you want, like, uh, before you even start hacking something, you need something like a playground. You need to learn, like, the object. How do I hack that object? And, and also you need the, something where you can test the, your attack. So it's actually really possible to buy a chemical plant. Um, <clears throat> note down the link. The problem is that plants are extremely expensive. Also, you cannot relocate them easily, and you need more than two people to run them. Uh, moreover, if you will hack it to the death, you will need more money to fix it. So hacking the real plants is actually not sustainable. And actually, in the industry, in the uh, proce chemical processing industry, or like in R&D, it is more common to use actually the model of the processes. So this is a realistic, in this research, we've been using the realistic model of vanilla acetate plant. It's a plant which uh, uh, produces a commodity chemical, vanilla acetate, which is then used for, to produce chemical adhesives, plastic, and so on. So, uh, and actually, like, with this talk, we also released two models of uh, uh, chemical plants which were transformed into the framework for cyber-physical exercises. We actually wanted to show you quickly how it looks like. Oh, we are good. So <clears throat> this is a MATLAB, and this is uh, how much far we can get to the open source. So modeling is extremely expensive. All, uh, all, chemi or like all processing industry models their processes, but it's a proprietary information. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, so <laughs> oh, no. um, the problem is, uh, so we've been the simulink, mo it's my, uh, simulink model of the vanilla acetate plant, and what you see on the, uh, what size is it? It is on the left side, it's actually the set, set points into the process. So if we will kick in a little bit inside, so this is the plan, this is, will be, uh, this is the source code which actually schedules all the routine of the supporting CCC uh, processes. I have something for you. <laughs> I look. How are they doing? <laughs> As you all know, it is not easy to get accepted as speakers at DEF CON, and you two have accomplished this. Congratulations, and thank all of you for staying, you know, late and seeing them. So give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> thank you. You all know the drill. Here's the DEF CON. <laughs> all right. Oh, ooh. good job. <laughs> <laughs> now I just want to see you continue. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> So, for example, um, the advantage of the, uh, of the Simulink models is they're easy to understand and it's extremely easy to uh, add attacks with just few mouse clicks. So, for example, if I go here, here we integrated the blocks where we can, for example, model different attacks on the controller signals. And uh, here's the different parameters. We can select the different attacks and so on. And here, if we will go one layer inside, uh, uh, this is the controller with, which handles, like, you, if you can see, this is the uh, attack values, and here's fake signals, and so on. And just to give you a feeling like what we've been working in, and we've built all of this. Um, so if you will go one layer here. So this is the entire control structure of the plant with all of the controllers, uh, transmitters, transmitters are sensors, 
and this is the controllers, and as you can see, there is a lot of parameters inside, and everything that we have been introducing you in this beginning, the attacker cannot hack the process if he does not understand the principle of control loops, how do you tune them, and so on. Um, yeah, so that was just a quick demo, just to give you a feeling of what we've been working for with. Okay, the stages of uh, cyber physical attacks. So just like a buffer overflow needs shell code, uh, then when you're attacking a process, you need a final payload uh, that you deliver to the process. And this uh, carries a set of instructions that are going to be carried out uh, on the target process. And final payloads are always bespoke. I mean, you can't take the final payload for one, uh, for one vinyl acetate plant and then play it on another vinyl acetate plant. But in general, uh, attackers go through uh, several stages of, uh, of hacking. And so an attacker uh, that's remotely attacking a process isn't immediately gifted with complete knowledge of process and all the things he has to manipulate uh, before he gets to deliver this final payload to the process. Um, so uh, uh, in general, you run through the attacks, uh, attacks and stages, but your knowledge is never complete. So once you first get into a process, you have the fog of war. You, know, you don't know anything about it. And then you start figuring out stuff, and you move through the stages, stages of them. Um, and then you have to circle back and say, like, oh, well, I, know, I need to know more about the process before I can start controlling the process and, uh, um, and uh, continue on from there. So the first stage of uh, hacking a, a process is access. So you have the guy uh, in, the, uh, in the coffee shop in France, and he's running over and hacking in the process. And in general, um, SCADA networks uh, have a traditional IT network where you get in, you know, just send, a, send your favorite flash out exploit to some clueless user, have them click onto it, onto the, uh, uh, onto the SCADA net or onto the business network, done. So generally, process control networks have, uh, have firewalls and additional protections uh, away from the business network. So there you've got to get, uh, get across antivirus, uh, antiviruses, database links, patch management systems, et cetera, and into the process control network. But once you're into the process control network, then you stop having to use hacker tools, because most of the things in the process control network will just respond to any properly formatted uh, command. So if you take a, a Modbus controller and you say, hey, go turn that pump on, and you throw at the Modbus controller, it just, will just uh, take that command and then run on it. So you can move freely about the, the, the SCADA network um, with, with most impunity once you get inside of it. And so if you don't have a whole bunch of stuff already all stuck together, then now there's people that will uh, sell you uh, SCADA exploit packs. So you can just run out into the network, apply a bunch of credit card to the problem, you're all done, you have a bunch of exploits for the SCADA network. Um, so there is an alternative approach, the approach that uh, was taken by Aaron Leverett um, using, uh, using Showdown. So one of the things you can do nowadays, if you don't really care who you're hacking into, is you can just run out to Showdown and say, show me all the industrial controllers out on the, the internet. There's way more than there should be. Um, go grab a bunch of exploits, go pop, 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 and then see where they lead. Um, so uh, a third approach you can get is that uh, um, sensors now are getting smarter and smarter. They're getting IP stacks. They have their own little CPUs um, and, uh, and operating systems and uh, are all getting to be part of the Internet of Things uh, so, uh, thing. So if you looked at my uh, presentation from, uh, um, from uh, S4 in 2014, I described how to take a SCADA attack and miniaturize it down all the way to well, fit, fit into the middle of one of these sensors. You just have to get the, uh, the sensor into the middle of the process, and it can unpack itself and, uh, and keep on going. So after that, you have uh, disco uh, discovery. OK, so you are in. So how much do you know about the plant? OK, well, I am in some plant. Uh, you really need to understand lots of things about it. So do you know what stripper is? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not exotic dancer. It's a stripping column. So you really need to understand the equipment when you try to hack a plant. So in general, the attacker need to know uh, this much of information about the plant, what and how the process is producing. So even if it is vanilla acetate plant, the actual chemistry and kinetics of the process are proprietary. How the process is controlled and wild, and wired. So it means uh, where is the location of the control valves, how the control loops are tuned, what is the control strategy applied, how the 
plant is built in vial, like basically how the sensors connected to the PLCs. And very important, what are the physical constraints of the plants? This stage of the attack starts very long time in advance with old-fashioned espionage and reconnaissance attacks. And then, for example, for most, many information you will need also to hack into the third parties. Like, for example, uh, most of the equipment is designed by third parties and chemistry is developed by third parties. And actually, the attackers has understood the necessity of the stage long time ago because the espionage attacks again, the industries has started long time ago with the samples dated to 2003. And just to quote you, the description of one of the APTs is that the goal of the attackers appeared to be collect intellectual property such as the design documents, formulas, and the manufacturing processes. So the attackers knows what to do. So they will be looking something like for this something like looks like chemical formulas, piping and instrumentation diagrams, uh, instrumentation list, wiring diagrams, and after the attacker figures this out like. He will understand like how the plant is built and operates. Uh, he will start thinking, okay, what can I do to it to cause persistent economic damage? So we'll, uh, at this stage, you we'll already understand how vanilla acetate plant works. So <clears throat> in general, uh, <clears throat> the easiest uh, way to cause economic damage would be to destroy the pipe which carries the final product into the vessels. That is easy, works, but easily detectable, easily fi fixable, so it's not persistent. The rest of the plant can be divided uh, into two parts, reactions and refinement. Refinement is a large part of the process, it's just approximately one kilometer long. So the attacker has a lot of opportunities to mess up with the things, but the operator also has a lot of opportunities to notice and to correct things. Moreover, you can always recycle product back and to try to refine it again. In contrast, if you will mess up with the reaction process in the reactor, uh, you reliably produce less product. So that is a good scenario for the persistent economic damage. And important to understand that even this simple analysis is not possible with the, without input of the experts. So <clears throat> after, so we resolve to attack the, in this, uh, in our attack scenario, we resolve to attack the reactor unit. Then the attacker has to start uh, to, it needs to figure out how the plant is built and wired. So this is one of the most time-consuming and difficult part of the uh, SCADA hacking. So the, uh, the hacker has to figure out the uh, <clears throat> relationship between tags in the PLC equipment and how that all looks on the diagrams. So <clears throat> most of the processes operate on the points, logic <clears throat> abstract layer. So everything what can be measured, basically all sensors and set, so actuators, those are points. The plant may have 10,000 points. What do they, where do they go? What do they do? So the attacker have to perform all of this mapping. Uh, it's a lot of work, and interestingly enough, uh, I don't remember the year, but the Havex malware has already exhibited their first attempts of the uh, attackers to actually map and mine their uh, uh, equipment in the field. So the attackers are already this far. So <clears throat> this stage, we already could figure out all of the mapping between equipment and controllers. So <clears throat> we are back to the vanilla acetate plant. We need to figure out uh, the location of the control loops. Uh, <clears throat> once we have that, uh, the attacker needs to understand how those control loops are uh, tuned. This is extremely important. Uh, the, Good place to go for that is um, <clears throat> uh, instrument engineering applications because they will have everything what you need. I've grabbed this, uh, I grabbed this screenshot from the internet. So for example, you will be looking for something like, well, that is a pressure transmitter and it serves the reactor control loop. Uh, it, we have here, this is, will be the tag. The next we have, it's, it's actually Yakogawa. There is also a model number of the equipment. Uh, there are all the parameters how the instrument is scaled and how it is used within the process. And what is also very interesting, we have also has a, a user who is allowed to modify this equipment. So we now know which account details we need to obtain. So with the <clears throat> what else the attacker needs to do is flows. In chemical plants, the things do not 
nicely flow from left to right. They flow all kinds of direction. So for example, in this our case in vanilla acetate, so acetic acid flows from the from tank to the reactor section and to the refinement section. It's too bad for us because we will need to operate the valve and that means that we will have to also watch the process in the refinement section. We would not want like to do that because we need to invade more design, uh, devices, but well. So this is, uh, the attacker will need to, will find this information on the flow diagrams. So uh, at this stage, we already uh, know everything about the control configuration and location of the control valves. So in, uh, in the context of the MATLAB model, those control, uh, the controllers are called as variables X and V, so, because we later will be using it on, the, on one table. What is very difficult to understand for the IT hackers is that obtaining control is not being in control. So first of all, the obtained control might not be useful to attack goal. And secondly, the attacker might not be able to control obtain control. And what does it mean? With that, we, control, we trans, uh, go into the control section, uh, stage of the attack. So till now, the attacker will, was discovering the static information of the process. But uh, physical processes have their dynamics, so they change over the time. And if you apply any input to, uh, to it, it will change. So the attacker needs to understand how much he can control the process, what is his um, uh, how much he can control the process. Um, so, as I mentioned together uh, earlier, once you hook uh, all the stuff, uh, all the stuff together into a process, they're related to each other um, uh, with the physics of the process. So, uh, if we adjust a adjust a valve um, over here, then what happens to everything else downstream? Uh, so, adjusting the temperature can also adjust the uh, pressure in the flow, and all the downstream effects need to be taken into account. Um, and so, one of the things we need to understand is how much uh, how much of the process can we change before all of the alarms and automatic shutdown routines kick in and start shutting down the process. That's okay. So this is the example. So I, to illustrate you that concept. So in the red, um, in the red, red square, you have the yes. plot. So I just adjusted some valve. I just changed something. As you can see, everything downstream has changed, and it changed in different scales. It, the response has different shape. And what is more interesting, for example, uh, in one case, something goes up and something goes down. This is. The responses of, of the process to the manipulations cannot be predicted by the attack, uh, by the attacker, and this is what he needs to figure out. Uh, <clears throat> and for example, as you can see, like why things go is different in different control loops, uh, not only because of the physics of the process, but also that because there are millions of parameters which influence the process response. So this is a control loop which we, we have been showing for, uh, before. So there are many parameters at each stage we will be influencing the response of the process to the manipulation. And the attacker needs to take into account all of them. The more, uh, uh, what is more important, when the attacker changes something and observes the input, he, he cannot never understand whether the response is a response to the attack or it's because of the sum configuration of the process. So just to give an example, in my earlier works, when I've been designing exploits and processes, I've been working with, I've been considering several of those parameters, and I have to really encode into my exploit the ways how I will be dealing with them. Uh, so one of the most difficult parts of hacking continuous processes is, uh, is process no, uh, nonlinearity. Most of the physical processes are nonlinear. What does it mean? In short, it means that the response of the process is not proportional to the input into the process. For example, if the process is heated, how the process behave when being heated from 140 degrees to 150 degrees is completely different when it further heated to 160 degrees. And if you never model the behavior of the process in that range, you don't know how the process will behave. So the behavior of processes is known to controllers as well to the extent of the modeling. So if the control algorithm has never been tested and designed to deal with the process in that controls uh, in that range, it will not be able to uh, control it. The problem of the attacker, he will move the process outside of the optimal op uh, envelope. 
So he have to deal with all of those strange behaviors of the processes, and it's not easy. So just to give you an example what is nonlinearity, you see it's just simple response, and it is reactor exit temperature. You change something, and the response is definitely nonlinear. And all of those spikes are extremely annoying to the attacker because they cause alarms, because it just hits some like maximum values. Um, another process, which, another problem, like one of the issues which we have to deal while hacking this particular process was that this was a very badly configured plan, and all the controls were purely uh, controlled. So whenever we've been trying to change something to our benefits, many control loops had a ringing effect. And if you will see this, like look at the blue circle, you can see, well, but that's like fluctuation is just kind of tiny little, like why do you even bother? The problem is that that tiny little fluctuation in one control loop cause enormous effect, impact on the other control loops. So, and unfortunately most of the control loops was, were causing alarms, so we could not really um, stay um, like end as a radar because we did not want to cause any alarms. So it took us around a couple of weeks to find a way how to deal with that. So in general, we, start, like, we apply two types of attacks, st uh, step attacks and periodic attacks. Step attacks is when you bring the process to time state and leave it there. And periodic attacks when you attack the process, leave, uh, let it recover, attack the process again, let it recover, and so on. So we have to test all of those control loops which we've, been, uh, we've identified in the uh, reactor section. We've tested them for multiple of parameters, and actually at the end, this was our mental model of the dynamic behavior of the process. Although um, I do want to know whether you measured yourself at five foot three with or without your high heels on. <laughs> <laughs> so that we've been like, yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, this is, since, since this was our first attempt to you see, like, this is the first public talk on the complete attack from start to end, so obviously this was the first attempt to understand the dynamic behavior of the process. So we, we were not op obviously optimal, so we're now trying to find the way to optimize it so it would fit in a small payload, like exploitable payload. So the, the outcome of the control stage is the attacker will need to classify the available control loops, like how they're useful for him, uh, uh, how how well he can control them. So we basically found those factors which would be, like for example, we use the sensi uh, sensitivity of the control loops. So highly sensitive loops are not reliably controllable, so you probably don't want to use them in your final payload. Uh, also, another outcome of the con uh, control stage is that alarm uh, propagation, you want to know what are the marginal parameters of the attack which still do not cause the alarms. So now we know. So we now know what we can control to which extent, and we can actually start designing the real attacks. And with that, we transition to the damage stage. So in the damage stage, you're trying to figure out. Okay, I know all this stuff I can do about the process. What am I actually going to do about it? So the damage stage is actually the least familiar stage to uh, um, <clears throat> to IT hackers. So. Um, there's a lot of good starting points uh, when you go and start looking at the damage stage. So one of the uh, good basic principles is if things happened in the real world by accident, you can probably make them happen um, by malicious intent. So you can go to all the places where these are recorded, to government databases, um, the plant zone databases, you know, like the chemical safety board, et cetera, and read about all the, th all the things that have actually gone horribly wrong. Um, and they're out there on the, uh, the internet um, uh, for, you, uh, for you to go and read. Um, so the target plant may not have been desi designed in a hacker-friendly friendly way. So you may really, really want to know what this particular value is, but there may no be no sensor there or no sensor close to it. Um, and the information may be spread out across the process. Uh, and uh, um, the control loops could be designed to control different parameters than the ones you want to actually reach in and control. It's like, oh, I would really like to uh, uh, change the pressure here, but there's no pressure control loop, and uh, so I won't do, uh, I won't do it. Um, so um, in this case, oh. Uh, in this case, so since we want to read, uh, so we, des uh, we decided to mess up with the production of vanilla acetate, so we won't actually make the plant produce less. 
To measure the impact of our attacks, we need to actually measure how much molecu molecules of the vanilla acetate are there in the reactor exit. The concentration of chemicals is usually measured by the analyzers. There are four analyzers in the vanilla acetate plant in this plant, and none of them in the reactor exit. Uh, there are on, only flow and temperature. Uh, in order to compute the volume, we need actually the concentration and the flow. The only available place where we could get those numbers is in the exit of the plant. But measuring there is too late because we, that values are available like in eight hours. So then you will have to attack something and wait eight hours until you can measure it. It's certainly not sustainable. So we've been like, the, like we've been actually in desperation because it seems like how do we proceed? We, we ha don't have numbers. We can't evaluate how effective our attacks could be. Uh, and this is at that point, I remember the presentation of Jason actually from another conference where he'd been talking about proxy sensors. So the concept behind that is following. So in general, you, there are two answers to, like, to measuring something. It's technician and engineer, engineer answer. Technician will tell you that something is decreasing or increasing. An engineer will tell you by how much. So by using proxy sensors, you actually can uh, obtain at least a technician answer. And a proxy sensor is something that changes with respect to another uh, parameter which you are interested in. So in, the, in our case, the proxy sensor is a uh, temperature in the reactor exit. So if temperature is decreasing, it means that less reaction is happening in the reactor. So with that, at least we can see whether our attack is effective or not. That was already a good start, but it still does not allow us to compare the effectiveness between different attacks. So we desperately needed the engineering answer. And this is where <clears throat> then we started to think further. Actually, process algorithms are extremely complex, and there are a lot of optimization applications running in each plant will try to optimize the uh, uh, like how the performance of the plants. And there will be a lot of internal, comp uh, like intermediate comp uh, computation. So we tried to, we decided to give a shot, like may maybe there will be some numbers computed in between which can be useful to us. So we started looking into the code and we, we knew that we need to look into some, uh, to find some ugly differential equation. And eventually we found a piece of the code which seems like, well, it seems like they're computing what we need. The problem was that the numbers which were, uh, these numbers, intermediate numbers, were extremely weird. We could not do really anything with them. They did not sum up to zero, to ha or to one, to hundred. They are just too small, it could not decode. So we did not know what to do with that, but still the gut feeling told us that's the right number. So we spent actually two weeks trying, playing with those numbers until we actually could figure it out. So eventually we could con uh, compute the concentration of the uh, vanilla acetate in the reactor exit, and with that we actually can finally uh, <clears throat> measure the effect of our attacks in dollars. So um, the outcome of the damage state is a portfolio of attacks which you classify uh, <clears throat> with respect to the damage potential, and then you just apply those attacks at the opportune time. Uh, so. You would think that this is all and we already done because we have our attacks, we can code it, so let's just like go and hack it. But that's not all. Um, so the final stage of uh, hacking a control system is cleanup. Um, so uh, in, in uh, most IT scenarios, you go hack into something, it's like, oh, I've got the databases, I've got all this stuff, and when I'm done, I erase all the logs and I'm just gone. I was, I was never really there. Um, but in hacking process control systems, if you leave the big smoking plant, then somebody will investigate the big smoking plant. And so you have to um, convince the people that are actually investigating this um, that uh, the big smoking plant was um, the result of uh, you know, operator error, uh, misconfigured equipment, all of those types of things. Um, so. Uh, um, having a human in the, uh, uh, in the control loop turns uh, this from just a purely cyber system into a socio-technical system. And uh, so since there's real people that are out there playing with the process and real people that are going to analyze the process when it's, uh, when it's all uh, bad and gone, um, then we can go and attack the system. So creating a f uh, forensic footprint. So... Uh, <clears throat> um, 
So if you come over there and you create a persistent problem in the plant and the production is going down, somebody's going to go uh, notice and say, like, why are we not making money? And to go and try and fix it. And so, but you can do things like timing the attacks when a particular employee uh, uh, is on shift, and then after a while to say like, oh, whenever, uh, whenever Bill's on shift, then things go horribly wrong and we don't make money, so let's go beat Bill a little bit. Um, <laughs> he must be the problem. Um, and so the employee can get, end up getting investigated instant, uh, instead of the process. So um, in this particular uh, case, we're going to show you uh, one where we uh, pick several ways that the temperature can be increased. And so our, our plan is we'll just wait for the ne next scheduled instrument calibration. We'll perform the, uh, the first attack, making it uh, inefficient. And then we'll wait for the maintenance guy to be yelled at and say, like, oh, you tuned it wrong. Please go tune it again. And then we'll just uh, perform the next one. And then uh, he'll go back and tune it again. We'll just pull forward the next one and the next one and the next one. So here we see uh, four different attacks um, on the reactor temperature and, uh, um, and uh, the results, and you can see they, they're very different. So if the uh, lines in there and the changes are timed with the, uh, with the recalibrations, then um, it really just looks like the guy's messing up and not getting the calibrations right. Um, so if eventually they will start thinking, okay, probably the reactor is not performing well. <clears throat> uh, they will call uh, actually for, uh, chemical forensics guys to investigate. It is not possible actually to see into the reactor. So how the forensic guys investigated the compute specific, they have a matrix to compute in which you can understand what is happening with the reactor. So the attacker has to understand how they do it in order to fool them. So <clears throat> this four plot is just like some of the metrics which we've been computing for the uh, uh, <clears throat> reactor performance. And although they look similar, they all tell completely different things. Strangely. So then just change attack patterns according to the debugging efforts of the plant personnel, and they will just keep thinking that they are not doing a good job. So uh, in general, um, we go through all of the, uh, the stages and we plan all this stuff out, some of which can be totally offline and some of which is interactive with the process. But we take all this stuff and we wrap it up into uh, what we call the final payload. And that's what we're going to stick inside of our attack and send into the, uh, send into the process. And so then if all things go well, then our attack works and uh, we make lots of money and everybody is happy. Well, I guess everybody on the attacker side is happy. There is a big problem right now. So like the plants really go through tremendous uh, modernization. So most of these really old sensors are now uh, <clears throat> substituted with a smart sensor which speaks IP and they're now part of the internet of things. So the plants are now connected to the internet and the internet can now talk to the plants. So the attackers are already in the plants. And uh, <clears throat> although like, uh, the argument like why we cannot improve the state of the security of the industrial control system is that like, well, we don't see many of those attacks. The problem of that, that according to the recent laws, all of those accidents are not available, like they classified information and they're not allowed to be public. But it does not mean that we have to lean on our chairs and do nothing. Cyber physical exploitation can be actually studied and we should do it. So, <clears throat> By understanding what the attacker needs to do and how, we can actually make exploitation harder, wait for the attacker where he has to go, <clears throat> and actually create really those network monitoring solution which works, because we know what to look for. And for the, that was for the defenders, but food for thought if you're an attacker. So uh, um, most of the things when you actually get into breaking a process are about, uh, uh, are about cost. And so one of the reasons that we study um, cyber physical attack is because all the other people that are um, probably out making money right now um, are studying cyber physical uh, attack. And so for most attackers, then um, the cost of an attack can quickly exceed the cost of the damage or the cost of the benefit they get there. Uh, there. So. Um, uh, if you actually make it harder and the attacker has to hack into a large number of devices or suppress a large number of alarms and spoof a large amount of data, his costs go way up and his testing goes way up and his chance of failure, failure goes way up. And so each process is unique, but um, 
if we look at a uh, um, wide range of scenarios, then, um, then we can start get, uh, seeing all the patterns. On the other hand, the opposite is true too. As we figure out how to deal with all the uniquenesses and all of the uh, processes, probably attackers are going to get better at their job too and figure out algorithms that can be applied a lot of different ways. And so SCADA uh, payloads for something that looks like a Metasploit are probably only a matter of time. Uh, so um, I guess in the end, um, if you want to be the evil James Bond billion and make millions of dollars then, uh, and start building your evil lair, um, then hacking chemical uh, and process control systems is probably not a bad place to, uh, to start, but it is a very complex and it's a, um, a very challenging uh, field of hacking. So uh, um, anybody that wants to come and join us and uh, uh, study, um, study hacking processes and physical damage, then uh, they should come and do so. Um, there is a SES village set up at the DEF CON, so just go and check more stuff there, and you can actually get some trainings there running right now as well. So with that, that's the end of our talk.